uh, I've called this uh, session the end of relativism. Uh, that may be a bit apocryphal uh, uh, or apop apoplectic in any case. But what, I'm, what I mean to be saying is that I think that we have come uh, to the end of a paradigm. We're, we're in the, the midst of a paradigm shift. And that some of the funny things that we go or that we see going on, funny in a tragic sense, uh, are uh, are effects of this shifting of the paradigm. And I, I, if we were to understand this, it may be that we would approach doing some of the things that we're doing a little bit differently. We might start doing something more, or something less. Uh, so I just like to raise this issue. Um, for your consideration, and of course, I would appreciate any kind of uh, feedback that you'd like to give me. Uh, some of this you have uh, seen before, I suppose, when I've talked about paradigms and paradigm shifts, and then uh, I may have a couple of uh, new twists on this, uh, uh, given the current situation. One, a little bit of background on this, uh, besides the normal work that you know I do around consulting and, and teaching, uh, I was asked uh, some time ago to go to a company um, uh, that's associated with INSEAD, uh, uh, an executive training group, to, uh, uh, to talk about uh, political correctness. And um, the, the issue was uh, corporations and companies and other people that, were, that, that found themselves in a climate of, of fear rather than a climate of respect and, and to, to address that issue. And since I'd just been recently working in a, a big school district in the United States, uh, right, uh, Clark County School District, which is in fact the second largest school district in the United States, on exactly this topic, which is shifting the focus uh, from essentially what not to do to more of a focus on what to do uh, as an alternative to uh, some of the political correctness paralysis that had occurred there. Um, I thought that I would um, um, be able to uh, address this issue for the CDEP, which is the uh, which is the executive program, and uh, yes, that's and that's been going quite well. Uh, so I'd like to share some of that with you on the possibility that you like might want to be using some of these ideas, or at least be aware that there seems to be a movement uh, in the general diversity inclusion, and I think more generally around intercultural issues. Uh, to move into a somewhat different approach to how it is that we're dealing with issues of tolerance uh, and um, inclusion. So let me uh, move to a couple of slides here that I think will illustrate this. So here's the uh, title slide, uh, The End of Relativism. Now, what I mean by relativism is uh, a paradigm that is uh, in contrast to positivism. Here is the positivist or Newtonian paradigm. The idea that I have here is that these are essentially paradigms from physics that when they transfer over into the uh, 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 social sciences, that they become, uh, that we rename them, but they essentially maintain the uh, assumptions of reality, the epistemology that is associated with the physics paradigm. In this case, the Newtonian paradigm uh, uh, comes over as positivism. And the idea here is that uh, reality has an objective existence. If you look in the same direction, everybody sees the same thing. Uh, if you have perfect knowledge, you can uh, control things. So for instance, this is associated with scientific management and. Um, Mostly, we don't take this position uh, in intercultural except for measurement. And when it comes to measuring things like, uh, you know, measuring competence and so forth, we tend to fall back into this positivist paradigm because there really is no good alternative. Uh, that's another topic. Uh, but uh, for the most part, we interculturalists uh, are operating with a relativist, not a positivist paradigm. And the reason that we are is because of something that happened at the turn of the last century, uh, because the, the, the notion associated with positivism was this hierarchy of civilization idea, that, that there were civilized people who were, of course, the people who were forming this model, and the proof that they were civilized was that they were civilized, and uh, it's like rich people saying that the reason, the proof that it's appropriate that they're rich is because they're rich, because if it wasn't appropriate, well, then they'd be poor. 
And then the other side of that issue is poor people deserve to be poor because otherwise they'd be rich. Then there are the people in the middle here, the barbarians that you can bring into civilization through colonialization or uh, other imperial means. Uh, in the U.S., we recently have been calling that nation building. You may have noticed how well that works. And then the, there, there's the underlying notion of, unfortunately, of savages, which, you know, by which I mean people that are not fully human. And, and that's the explanation for how, why it is and how it is that you can enslave people whether that be traditional uh, uh, agricultural slavery, uh, such as was associated with many Africans uh, in the New World, uh, or wage slavery, or sex slavery, or other kinds of conditions where people are being significantly exploited. Now, it was against this model that the anthropologists uh, picked up on Einstein's idea, and Einstein generated the notion of a perspective. He said, look, you know, we can't know the universe, and you know, absolutely not everybody in the same look in the, that looks in the same direction sees the same thing because they're looking from different perspectives. And that generates the notion of perspective, the notion of context. That events, um, because of this, events can't be controlled, but we're limited by the system. Our behavior is limited by the system. And it leads us to think that, con that cultures uh, can't be, can have now be understood and only be understood from perspective, for in their own context. And so you have this wonderful shift, I mean, and it really was a dramatic change from this hierarchy of civilization to the more relativist view. Now, you may notice that there continue to be people who are who are promulgating this notion of the hierarchy of civilization, and, and in fact, you could argue that some of the neoliberal things that are going on, in fact, are hearkening back exactly to that idea. So it's not like that's dead. It's just that there has been a significant movement towards relativism and observing cultures, uh, particularly cultures, in their own context. The problem with relativism from the very beginning is that there was no mechanism for these groups to talk to each other. So you had A defined in terms of A and understood in terms of A, but A in fact couldn't understand B because A was A. And you, you, you could only understand B by becoming B. So it, it, it led to a kind of a, an odd notion that only by assimilating to the culture, assuming these were cultures, could you understand it. And this stays with us today, this idea that you really can't understand somebody from another culture, particularly if that culture is defined in terms of gender or some other politically loaded condition. You can't understand them because you're not them. You haven't had their experience. You don't live in their context. And consequently, you can't really understand them except possibly in the sort of... Uh, abstract intellectual way but you know essentially the notion of empathy as we frequently use it in intercultural work is not allowed epistemologically with this relativist notion uh, what this has done is uh, has generated uh, some attempts to deal with it there have been a, there have been two historical movements that I would like to talk with you about one of them is the historical movement of intercultural communication, and the other one is the historical movement of critical theory. I think that two of the two of these things uh, are going together. Let me pause for just a moment to see if there is a message. All right. Uh, so I see that uh, Patrick is saying you can understand that by accepting uh, to live their experiences as they do. Right, yeah, well, that's based on the idea that we can shift into that alternative uh, view. Typically, we can't do that temporarily, um, but uh, it will, uh, but uh, certainly that's the idea of how it is that you go about understanding somebody in another uh, perspective. Uh, I should be, uh, I've also have a message from Maura who says, say this will be recorded. Uh, so I guess this is being recorded, which means that you have an option of going back and uh, taking a look at it uh, later. It's a tendency to prioritize uh, individualism, a neoliberal uh, uh, thing, goes back through this tiered system. Well, I think that the neoliberals are you know, basically hearkening back to this kind of absolutist um, uh, 
uh, reality. It's it's a you know it, it was always an odd kind of application of Darwin and you know this social Darwinism notion that somehow the survival of the fittest are the people who rise to the top of whatever the condition is and the proof of that is that they rose to the top. You know that's that it's kind of a self fulfilling prophecy. And yeah, I do think that we I do think that we see uh, a very similar kind of thing going on. You know, which is. It, 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 in some ways, a re, a, an attempt to return to that earlier, um, uh, that earlier, uh, uh, more positivist paradigm. So, um, let me go back to the to what I think has been going on. Here we go. I'm just you know I'm just coming back to the slides here. All right, so. With the instigation of relativism at the beginning of the last century, we had a movement uh, from uh, intercultural communication uh, attempting to define a way for these groups to communicate with each other. So with the shift of the Boaz, Frank Boaz, and, and supported by Margaret Mead and many others, of course, uh, moving uh, into uh, this, this kind of uh, relativist uh, uh, alternative to social Darwinism, uh, about mid-century, you started seeing people working around the communication of these things. So Worf and Sapir, the Sapir-Worf hypothesis of uh, language and the relationship of language and culture, I think should be understood as an attempt to deal with this issue of context and communication. What does it mean? How can we use language in a way that might uh, conceivably bridge these things? And that was the, that was the, the specific goal of Benedict and subsequently of uh, of Hall was to create the so-called edit categories, and the edit categories, as most of us know, were the ones that would allow us to bridge across two cultures, not because the cultures were subject to the same universal principle, but because we could generate an, a, a comparison in terms of our constructed edit category. Now, uh, uh, both Benedict and, and particularly Hall were heavily criticized uh, by other relativists at the time for, for seeming to, to go back to a more positivist view, meaning that it was difficult for people to understand that these were constructed categories, that, that there really was no individualism, there really was no individualistic culture. There was only the observational category of individualism and collectivism that would allow us to make comparisons amongst these groups and then to make certain kinds of adjustments in the way we approach things so as to be able to communicate or understand across these groups that otherwise were isolated from one another. A difficult concept uh, for the, uh, for, for the, uh, 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 the, the non-relativists of the time. And then, then you have the rise of intercultural communication, uh, Bateson, Barnland, uh, Condon, including myself and many others, that uh, generated this idea throughout the late 20th century, and uh, you could argue continue uh, to do so. However, there was a parallel development. And the parallel development was the development of critical theory. So starting with the Frankfurt School, and, and uh, this is, this picked up this idea of relativism, but not so much in the idea that it, it was um, justifying the um, separate but equal resistant, uh, equal existence of these different groups, but that it explained ideology, explained the influence of ideology, that there was a way in which these groups were generating different ideological positions, and that that in turn uh, was generating a fields of, of, of influence emanating from these groups. Now, and that idea gets picked up uh, partially by postmodern critical theory that suggests that um, ideology and power are in fact the only way that these groups can relate to one another. That there is a, that, that every discourse is essentially a discourse of power where one group is attempting to dominate the other so as to generate the conditions for contact or the conditions for interaction. But since we have no idea of how to bridge those uh, two groups except by assimilating one to the other, uh, it generates this condition of power. And that idea uh, was taken into critical pedagogy um, and uh, remains with us still as postmodern uh, critical theory, particularly in educational contexts, 
where um, essentially any attempt to understand something outside of your own context is colored sufficiently by your own context as to um, make it suspect. Now, to put it bluntly, these people won. Uh, that if you if you think of this as a kind of a of, of some competition, I'm, I don't think that that's probably a, that's an overly simplistic way to talk about it. But if you look at these two movements uh, in terms of which one ended up precedent in educational uh, organizations, you would say that the critical theory position ended up far more influential in a wide range of educational settings than the intercultural position. Uh, interculturalism uh, that originally kind of moved into uh, communication theory departments uh, found itself essentially pushed out by the critical theorists who rightly saw it as being contrary to these assumptions of critical theory, which is it was assuming that you could uh, empathize and you could acquire the experience of somebody in another group, even though you weren't in that group. That was Edward T. Hall's original idea. And the, uh, the, uh, and, and the, the, the uh, critical theorists basically are saying, or at least the postmodern critical theory people are saying, ah, you can't do that. And for the most part, they have ended up precedent. What that has generated in the extreme is a kind of political correctness. Now, and I'm going to talk about political correctness in, the, in, in sort of its essentially, it's, an, its original idea, which since we're locked into this cultural frame, people are naturally trying to impose their own idea on others. And when they are successful, they become the dominant group. So you know, white males in the United States, males of, white males of European, Amer European heritage are the dominant group. And what that means, in terms of critical theory anyway, is that they are successfully dominating others by saying, here are the rules you should follow, and those rules are the rules of their own culture. Uh, the political correctness part of this is that non-dominant groups need to be protected from that, you know, that there's a kind of oppression associated with this, this fieri, of course, that, that there's an oppression associated with the dominant group, and that to preserve human rights and dignity and and diversity, we need to protect the non-dominant groups. And this means the dominant group members need to be responsible for explicit and implicit biases, and that's, so we have a lot of emphasis on politically correct language, a lot of uh, concern with microaggressions, um, and so forth. Now, in my opinion, this is probably all necessary. It's, it's not that there isn't an attempt of one group to dominate another. It's not that this, that this is a bad description of how people, how these groups essentially relate to one another. The problem with this is that it's not usually taken in the context of there being any alternative. So this, you know, basically we have nothing to do except to control the power of one group over another. And I think this is, I, I think this is backfired. I think this has generated this shift uh, from positivism to relativism in a kind of a um, of an unalloyed um, form, where facts in the positivist view become uh, selected in the relativist view, that a dispute in the positivist view becomes a clash of narratives, as you uh, hear people speak of, that argument uh, seeking the best evidence, it becomes appropriately the manipulation of facts to create this uh, more powerful narrative. And, and, and let me emphasize, appropriately the manipulation of facts, because um, there's nothing else. There's, no, there's nothing else we can do except manipulate facts according to this critical perspective. And that news then, uh, rather than being objective, is necessarily subjective, and uh, it's real or fake, but in both cases, it's subjective. And this has created, I think, what I would call a perfect storm of defense. And uh, here you recognize the developmental model. Um, most of you are familiar with it, so I won't go through it again. But uh, what I think is happening is that we have a lot of people coming out of denial as a result of the uh, of, of, of exponential rise in, in, in migration, uh, refugee and, and, and other uh, mobility issues. Uh, 
Uh, and that, because that's not very well prepared for, and nobody's really thinking about, you know, how fast can you do that, is generating a lot of defense. So you have a lot of uh, us and them, good and bad, you know, they're coming to take our jobs. That's not the politically correct problem. The politically correct problem is the failure of minimization, the failure of tolerance, the failure of uh, this, you know, of the goal really of political correctness, which is to control the defense by minimizing the difference and focusing on the, uh, on the uh, similarity amongst people, uh, uh, that, that this, has been a, this has turned out to be an unstable condition. And it, it and it's and it's dissolved rather quickly through um, uh, demagoguery, um, uh, through uh, uh, reminders that you know the your ancestors were killed by their ancestors, and this is enough to pull you out of a state of tolerance, and apparently, and throw you back into a state of defense. And then a third thing has happened, which is really disturbing. And that is that the acceptance of cultural difference, that is the idea that, yes, there are alternative perspectives, is, has been essentially hijacked by fascists and others, as I wrote in the description, you know, who are saying, you accept cultural difference, we're culturally different, uh, even though part of our culture is to want to destroy every other culture, but that's okay, we're still a culture, and so you should be respectful of us. And that's, I call that hijacking the rhetoric um, in this case, uh, it's a rhetoric of bigotry that's hijacking the rhetoric of, uh, of acceptance. So that's pushing us back into this defense position. So these three things, I think, uh, are conspiring uh, to, to raise defense to a uh, significantly dangerous level. And I'd like, after we pause here for a moment, I'd like to suggest that part of the problem here is that we have shifted from positivism to relativism enough to generate that acceptance. But because of what's happening back in positivism and the failure of relativism to move forward into something else, uh, it's been hijacked in, in the service of the positivism. Um, and of course, I'll make the case that if we move forward into more constructivism, that there, that's one possibility, I think possibly one of the only ways that we can be moving out of this uh, condition, at least uh, in terms of epistemology. So I, I would like to share with you a few more things in that regard, but let me stop for a moment and come back and pick up a few comments. All right, and I, I'm on my own on these comments, so I'm not going to be terribly, I'm not a very good multitasker, and uh, I'm not sure that uh, I'm going to be able to, uh, to uh, do a very well job, a very good job, but uh, please feel free to type a, type a comment and I will, uh, I will pick it up. Maybe, maybe. Ah. Here's somebody who says, I didn't understand the failure, the, fail, the, the failure of PC, the failure of political correctness, yeah. What I think uh, has happened with political correctness is that it has, it has indeed pointed out that there is a tendency for dominant groups to oppress non-dominant groups, but that because it doesn't have an alternative way for people to be relating to one another, the only thing political correctness can do is to establish tolerance. And as you probably know, I define tolerance in terms of minimization. You know, so um, I don't think that political correctness can epistemologically, or at least it can't, it can't coherently generate the condition of the acceptance of the other as equally complex but different. I mean, sometimes you hear that rhetoric of, of political correctness, but may I point out to you that virtually all programs that are, uh, are anti-prejudice programs are programs about what not to do. They're programs about don't, be, uh, don't engage in microaggressions, don't engage in this uh, inappropriate behavior, that inappropriate behavior. Basically, please, um, or not please, the demand to avoid uh, the oppression uh, of others by insisting that they do things your way or that there's something wrong with them if they're not doing things your way. That's the you know, sort of dominant group oppression. And, um, you know, while certainly that happens, if there's no sort of alternative other than to get people to stop doing that, that's what's failing. 
is because people, in fact, are not stopping doing that. All they're doing is pretending to stop do that, stop do that, and stop doing that. They are, you know, they're engaging in politically correct language, but in fact, not shifting behavior into anything that we might call a real uh, climate of respect for diversity. So um, Patrick is saying um, that uh, bigots deserve status. Um, oh, I guess you can all see uh, this. Um, uh, yes, I don't think that we should be trying to convince bigots uh, to think differently um, uh, at all. Uh, I, I, and I do think that that you know people have a right to think what they think, and we if we don't like it, that's that's fine. What I do think we need to do, however, is to have alternative ways uh, that, that we have defined of relating to one another. Since bigots, for the most part, are falling back into that more positivist hierarchy of civilizations, we're higher in the, in the pecking order, and therefore we can tell other people what to do because you know we're basically God's chosen people. I think that those of us who may have an alternative view of that, don't have to try to convince those people that there is another way to do it, but we need to have defined an alternative way of doing this. And, and I think that's what Edward T. Hall was originally trying to do. He was trying to create, to take this relativist condition, these, this cultural relativism, and generate the conditions for us to be communicating respectfully with one another. And I, I'm wondering if we have lost sight of that goal, in sometimes being overwhelmed ourselves by some of this political correctness, and thus we're spending time trying to combat nastiness rather than creating respect. I agree that training is uh, that diversity training tends to be about um, this is from Jane Silver tends to uh, uh, avoid uh, othering, uh, right? Uh, and of course, that's a that's a developmental issue because if you other in the ethnocentric sense, you in fact are generating disrespect in most cases. But at, at least the way I define that, if you other on an ethno relative side, you are othering in the sense of acknowledging the the equally complex but different existence of the other person. Uh, and I see much of the movement from ethnocentrism to ethnorelativism is learning how to, uh, to bring otherness into a, a, you know, an equal and respectful position as opposed to a, a denigrated position and to not stop at the, at the middle point, you know, what I call the end, of re the end of ethnocentrism, which is to say, let's just be tolerant of one another since that, I'm really quite convinced is an unstable position that is easily destroyed by um, even minor demagogues, never mind some of the major ones that are floating around right now. Uh, another comment uh, um, from away, it seems, uh, it seems like now everything is a microaggression or can be used uh, as such in an argument and stops people from talking. Yeah, that's why I was uh, called uh, to talk to these um, these corporate people is that they found themselves in the situation where people were just not talking to each other. And, I, and it's a little easier in some ways to deal with this in a corporate situation than in an educational one because uh, the corporation is in the business of coordinating people towards some end. You know, they have a task to do. And for the most part, they, they, they believe that there is value in diversity. And, uh, but they recognize that that value is not necessarily gotten unless you do something appropriate and and they see the value being destroyed they when people are not able to talk about their differences they can't bring the differences to bear on the task and that destroys the potential value of the of the diversity and so they're just left with the problems and they have no added value so there's a, a big impetus in the corporate context to try to figure out how to not make political correctness generate this climate of fear and that's why I've been taking this, this point of view of let's talk about what to do as opposed to what not to do, um, but with the caveat that, you know, there are some things that you really have to not do, <laughs> but that shouldn't be the end of the story. <laughs>
All right. Um, I agreed the importance of the generation as uh, can you share experience in helping companies, individuals in uh, generate. Can you help? Uh, can you talk about the generating respect? Uh, yeah, uh, of course, I, I think it's a developmental idea. And I think what we need to be doing is helping people generate an appropriate epistemology. And I know that sounds really abstract and really complicated, but the idea is pretty simple. And that is, if you have the idea that there's only one reality and you know what that is, then anybody who's different from you, you figure just doesn't get it, you know, that you get it and they don't. And for whatever reason you get it, you know, you're, you're, the, uh, you're God's chosen or you're just smarter than they are or whatever the reason is, if there's only one reality and somebody appears to be different, there's something wrong with them or you, <laughs> but then given that choice, frequently it's them and not you that has something wrong. So the, basically the, that position, that single reality position doesn't go anywhere. It can't go anywhere in what it is that we're talking about anyway. It, it would appear that the relativist position, taking that as the paradigm shift, would have more potential for allowing people to uh, respect one another, except for the problem of how do those, how do those groups relate to one another? Or how do they, how, how do they communicate? And lacking a, a good, uh, uh, lacking the ability to construct a, a, a bridge, to engage in bridge building, I'm afraid we fall back into the problem of uh, trying to protect one group from dominating the other, and then, then we're back into uh, political correctness. So, I think that the, the first step when we're working with any organization is to, is to make the epistemological case that we are engaged in a kind of co-ontological or co-creative, co-generative condition, and that we are together making up whatever the conditions are. And we need to accept that we're making it up. Once we do that, we can then consider the possibility of making it up differently. And that's where we want to be going. And so the, the what to do is to move into a uh, condition where we all of us are taking more responsibility for making up the conditions that we're in. And we're not uh, uh, defaulting to either the single reality where there's something wrong with everybody else but me, nor are we defaulting to the idea that we all live in our own little separate contexts and we have to protect each other from being dominated by the other context. We don't stop at those positions. We move on to one that is a more constructive position. So here, uh, if I wanna move from defense to minimization, I need to learn to see commonalities how can you see commonalities without being uh, politically correct? Well, I think it's a matter, it, 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 there's nothing wrong with seeing commonalities, of course. I mean, we, we, we have lots of commonalities, you know, you know, everybody loves their kids and, you know, we all eat and sleep and, you know, I mean, there are a lot of things that, that we have in common that are important. Um, there's nothing wrong with seeing those commonalities nor acknowledging them. What's wrong is if we stop there. So it's one thing to come to that point as an alternative, particularly to defense. It's, as I say in some situations, it's a good thing to do, but a bad place to stop. So it's a good thing to, to, to acknowledge common humanity, but it's a bad place to stop. We need to be moving from that into the, uh, the recognition that our humanity is a co-generative condition where we are collectively constructing conditions that we're living in and that, uh, and that we need to be taking responsibility for that and doing it in a way that serves uh, our, our mutual purposes. Uh, cultural humility, I think, uh, uh, from Susan is you know, definitely a big part of that, uh, but more than humility. I mean, the humility leads us to say, yeah, we are one way of organizing the world. I think that's a necessary step to get out of ethnocentrism. However, the humility in and of itself doesn't generate the responsibility for the construction of the reality that we live in. So I'd say, again, it's a good thing to do, but uh, a bad thing to only do. Uh, so 
the comment here is that uh, the the categorization of culture as relativism or positivism. Uh, well, I, I guess I differ a little bit. That these are not characterizations of culture. This is these are characterizations of epistemological positions, positions of you know basic assumptions uh, about the nature of reality. And so you really, I, I wouldn't normally call them um, uh, perspective. I wouldn't call them cultures. Um, and I am, by the way, following Thomas Kuhn. Uh, not that he can't be criticized, but uh, his work on the structure of scientific revolution is the basis for this idea that uh, paradigms change from time to time. Uh, and uh, during the time of change, people tend to exaggerate the previous paradigm uh, to sort of keep it from changing. You know, that is because it's the familiar one, so they tend to keep, uh, to, to hold on to it and thus exaggerate it. So some of the excesses of political cor correctness right now may be seen as being exaggerations of the dying paradigm, uh, resistance basically to moving to another one, which I call constructivism, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's the, it's the readout into social science of the, the shift that's already occurred in physics from um, um, relativism to uh, quantum mechanics as a, as a primary organization of, um, of, of reality. Uh, so the rest of that comment is, um, how can we help people overcome the fear of the unknown and encourage other people to have the basis of unknowns? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, I mean, you're right. What this is about is existential fear. And what we're, what we're experiencing, I, in some other work I've been doing recently, I, people have been asking me to write about cults and culting phenomena and it's what's going on in the United States and some other places in the world. Are they, is this sort of like a large scale cult phenomenon? And the short answer to that is, yeah, I, I think it is. And one of the things that cult leaders are good at doing is generating a condition of fear inside the group, inside the boundary of the group, uh, in which anything that's other is an existential threat. It's not just a threat. It's an existential threat, meaning that the outsider is a threat to the very existence of the insider. And this existential threat then drives all kinds of completely irrational behavior because existential threats are not rationally dealt with they you know these are threats to existence and one uh, you know fights back uh, against that so when you define a whole bunch of things as existential threat then you can set up this extremely strong us and them a uh, boundary which as we see is apparently going on uh, uh, around us so yeah we need to be able to talk to each other and once again that's it we need to talk to each other and we all would say we need to talk to each other. And that's why I'm pointing out that some of the things that we are supporting out of that relativist frame, in fact, are precluding us from talking to each other. The excesses of political correctness, and I would say the basic epistemological assumption that we are locked into our context is in fact precluding us from talking to one another. At the, and so we're using a, a paradigm in, in many cases that is in a subtle and sometimes not so subtle way, precluding us from doing the thing that we say we want to be doing. All right. Um, creating new conditions uh, means that the groups have to change. Uh, I wouldn't start out that way. Um, you know, when, I, I think it's not just uh, just me, but a lot of people I think are talking about um, the, the construction of third culture. What happens if you have people mutually uh, adapting to one another? And I, I think when you do that, you can, act, you can start with the position that you're not asking people to change. You're just asking people to uh, engage in a mutual adaptation with other people. But that doesn't mean they're changing. That just means, you know, I call it, you're increasing your repertoire of behavior. You know, you're like, when you talk to your grandmother differently than you talk to your girlfriend or your boyfriend uh, <clears throat> or your partner, that you're not becoming a different person, you know, you're not changing, you just are engaging in a repertoire that includes talking to grandmother, <laughs> you know, style, that's different than talking to partner style. And, you know, it seems to me that a lot of this, a lot of the adaptation that we are asking of people in their multicultural situations are of that type, you know, in the increasing repertoire. When you approach it that way, it tends to reduce the anxiety of you have to change. <laughs> 
you also have to be careful that if people are operating at denial in the DMIS terms anyway, uh, any change is, is existentially threatening. And so there needs to be some, de- some rather careful development towards um, ethno-relativism before you talk about change uh, too much. In order to co-create the world, we need to move to a meta level. That is correct. And that's what we know how to do. For years, we've been talking about bridging, building bridges, bridging between cultures, allowing intercultural communication to occur as an adaptation, not as an assimilation. What we're saying is we can allow cultures, that is contexts, to maintain their integrity and we can, with a certain kind of, 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 of uh, education and practice, we can learn how to create bridges between those two contexts in such a way for them to maintain their integrity and to interact, to, to mutually adapt with one another. I mean, that's what, in my opinion, the original concept of intercultural communication was. And I th- what I'd like to see us do <laughs> is, it's hard to be radical in the sense of let's go back to our roots, but I'd really like for us to go back and, and kind of resurrect that idea that this is what we're about is, is doing that meta level bridging, you know, meta coordination between coordinating systems. And, and there are a lot of good thinkers, I mean, Gregory Bateson and others, that I think were trying to say that back in the day and um, before the critical social theorist people took over uh, education. There was a lot of talk about that, and uh, I'd like to see us uh, maybe go back and do that. So let me, do, let me spend my last few minutes here talking some more about the constructivist paradigm uh, as uh, has been requested by uh, one of you. So I'm gonna go back to the slides here. So let me see, here we are at the perfect storm. So when we look at the constructivist paradigm, uh, it, this is my clever graphics there, you know, with, with uh, <laughs> a nod to Escher. Uh, the idea uh, is that we are co-creating our reality, including ourselves. So, you know, that we, we don't have an a priori or an absolute existence. On the other hand, we're not just figments of other people's imagination, you know, that we are in the process of co-constructing each other. And this idea has been central to symbolic interactionism, you know, for decades. So it's not like a new idea, but it's an idea that fits in this paradigm better than it fits in uh, the either relativist or, I mean, in the, either the relativist or the absolutist paradigm. The thing that, that brings this more into the quantum view is the idea that, um, that what we're doing is not causing things to happen and we're not generating systemic change. We are influencing the probability of things and that when we co-create something, we are influencing the probability of one thing versus another happening. So it's a different way of thinking about causality and one that I think is probably more consistent with co-evolutionary uh, thinking. And it does then generate the idea that other cultures are different experiences of this intention and expectation. They're different constructions of reality. And, and that when another, another group of people are co-creating the reality, and we're co-creating the reality over here, but we could be creating the reality that way. And they could be creating the reality this way. So it's the, it's the opening up of the possibility that we could construct um, to use the technical term, a facsimile, you know, like a low resolution copy, we could create of the alternative reality. And that would allow us to have the experience of the other, which all of us would agree, I think, is the basis of empathy. So empathy is not an intellectual understanding of the other person, it's a sharing of experience. But since their experience is different than yours, the sharing of the experience has to be based on a sort of perceptual flexibility, a perceptual plasticity. And this generates, I think, the idea of what I call contextual acuity, which is being able to recognize your own context from a meta level. So you're able to see yourself in context. This is, of course, the basis of all uh, cultural self-awareness ideas. And then the additional notion of agility. These are you know, terms that are used these days in corporate context a lot. The agility idea, which is the self-reflexive ability to shift from one of these perspectives to the other. And 
once again, let me say that there is a pretty strong rhetoric of this shift of perspective, but not a very good epistemological base for it. Meaning we talk about shifting perspective, but if we don't have the paradigm to support it, we end up sympathizing, not empathizing. You know, and I use that term to mean we end up assuming that other people think that what we'd think if we were in that position, as opposed to acknowledging that other people are different and that they think something different than we would think if we were in that position. So like of you, you, you don't put yourself in somebody else's shoes because when you find all you find out about is yourself, if you happen to be in those shoes, that's a different story than trying to find out about the other person. Um, and we, the, one of the ideas of constructivism is to get away from this notion of being locked into context and to, and to, to, to put those contexts into a more uh, dynamic, to give them a more dynamic definition uh, and thus to allow for a more movement uh, back and forth between them. And finally, this I think allows us to do uh, ethicality, that this is the big missing piece in all of this and that is for us to be able to make ethical commitments. We need to recognize, we need to move through the relativism of, uh, of alternative perspective. We need, to, we need to recognize and in fact be able to experience the other and only then can we make a commitment that goes back to the maintenance of our own integrity. If we make a commitment back in the seeking truth part there, we're simply imposing our point of view on others. It's imperialism. It's the same thing that relativism was set up to counteract. So we do need to do the relativist thing, which is the, the taking of perspective, but we need to do it in a way that leads to a more constructivist co-creation and doesn't just stop at that point, in which case uh, we're not in fact taking perspective, we're uh, simply uh, negotiating context. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to come back to the comments and uh, we'll take the last uh, few minutes here to, uh, to pick up on that. So uh, that was to Alet. Uh, can I say more about the constructivist paradigm? <laughs> well, that, that's more. Uh, I've written about this recently, by the way. Uh, I've been doing a lot of these encyclopedia uh, uh, articles. I, I, I like them because they're like the little three or four page things, you know, and you have to yeah, you, you, you have to think hard about how to be succinct and try to be clear and accessible. And so I've got one of them on constructivism in a, an encyclopedia called uh, Multicultural America, which is not as um, America-based as it might sound. It's you know, actually more generally intercultural. And I've written another one on constructivist intercultural communication in uh, the uh, an encyclopedia called the International Encyclopedia of Intercultural um, Communication, edited by Young Kim. The first one is edited by uh, Car uh, Carlos Cortez. And um, so these, if you're looking for some, in, some definitions that you might be able to use in your own work expressed in a kind of succinct way, uh, I would recommend those two uh, parts. Another comment here, a part of shared humanity is neuroscience. Um, well, neuroscience looks at things that are, that are conceivably shared by human beings. Yeah, I agree with that. And <clears throat> what insights from the field might general, generally use usefulness for us? Um, well, I, it seems to me that the, so far anyway, the interesting thing about neuroscience is that it allows us to look at changes in brain states in ways that you know, simple brain waves and other kinds of things were not very precise in being able to see like different blood flow, different activation of different areas of the brain. And by looking at uh, that activation of, of different areas of the brain, we are able to say uh, with some greater assurance that people are shifting from one perspective to the other. We're able to say, for instance, that when you make the shift from figure to ground in that vase and the, the faces and the vase in the middle, that in fact there's a change in your brain state and I think that's important because we might be able, on the basis of that, uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to measure whether people are uh, 
what kind of differences they are perceiving. And if I'm correct that the complexity of perception of differences is an important part of what we're doing, then we could, uh, I think we could perhaps see that uh, with neuroscientific methods. The other thing that neuroscience does, and this is not a new thing, but it's something that it now can do better than it did before, is to look at the plasticity of perception. Plasticity means that it looks at the way in which perception itself the activity of the retina, the activity of your oral nerves, are operating as constructions of reality. That the perceptual system is not a passive receiver, it's an active constructor of reality. So the very basis upon which we are interacting with the world around us is already constructivist. It's already, we are already engaging in construction. So it's the extension of that perception into the way in which we're relating to one another that I think neuroscience uh, is in a position to support uh, uh, better than it has in, in the past anyway. We have to take a stand in the universe and accept responsibility for our, our choice. That's what I mean by accepting responsibility, yes indeed. And that's what Perry uh, calls commitment in relativism. And, and Will, William Perry, uh, supported by, more recently by Lee Knefelkamp, whom I'm sorry to say has recently died. So for those of you who know her or know her work, I'm, I'm sorry to say that she uh, has passed on. Um, and we're planning on uh, developing a, a page on our website uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, memorializes some of her work and, and other things. Uh, so for just FYI for those of you who, uh, who know her. Uh, but anyway, her her work, her life uh, lifetime work was to uh, was to take that basic idea of uh, of ethical commitment and update it and put it into the the politically sensitive uh, context, including a lot of gender work. She was a, a very well known feminist to bring that idea of commitment into this complex uh, arena that frequently is dominated by political correctness. And what she's done instead. And it's not that she was against avoiding prejudice or being careful about how we talk to each other. Of course she was. But she's also saying we need to make commitments. We need to be able to act authentically to maintain our integrity. How can we do that and be respectful of the other? And the way that Perry originally suggested is we do so by acknowledging the viability of the other person's perspective, the viability of the other person's reality, not their perspective on some other reality, but the way in which they're constructing reality. We recognize the viability. We recognize the, the workability of that. And yet we move in a different direction. So to follow this, to go back to, I guess, uh, uh, Patrick's original point here, uh, we would need to acknowledge the reality of, of, of fascists and, and bigots and say, yes, indeed, the world could be that way, and yet we will work with others for it to be a different way. But that's, a, that's the way that we respectfully disagree with somebody, and it doesn't mean that you become less uh, powerful in your commitment to the alternative of that, it just means that your commitment to the alternative is not in the context of there being no choice. Your commitment to the alternative is, well, yeah, there's a choice, and, but we choose this, not that. Uh, we choose respect, not bigotry. We choose uh, uh, engaging in larger systems, not smaller systems. We choose interdependence, not absolute independence. There are various things that you can say we choose, even though it could be the other way. And that, that's what I think Perry uh, was trying to get at. Uh, Susan asked, can you suggest uh, an approach for discussing racism, uh, specifically systemic uh, supremacy? I, I assume what you mean by that is, is uh, empowerment and, or institutional empowerment or, or disempowerment. Um, and yeah, I think that we need to acknowledge that people uh, have different color experiences. Uh, that uh, in the U.S., for instance, if you're a person of color, you have a different experience than if you're a white person in the U.S., and this is uh, in general true. So when I'm, when I'm dealing with uh, the issue, I, I, I talk about having the experience of color and the experience of culture. And I'm saying that these are two rather different things. The experience of color is always an external, uh, it's, it's an ascription, basically, not an affiliation, whereas the, the experience of culture is an affiliation, it's an internal uh, identification with the group and the coordination in the group. 
And so the these two, but two, these two things both exist. They, they, they're both they're, both of them are operating. And racism has to do with the way in which ascription works in the society. But we ought not to throw out the affiliation with the ascription, meaning that we should be able to acknowledge the cultural piece while disacknowledging the ascription that's going on around issues like color or eye folds or uh, being fat or thin or, or, or having some sexual orientation or whatever the criterion is uh, for, a script, for ascribing somebody to one category as, another, as opposed to another. We, we can avoid that while still maintaining respect, awareness, and the ability to talk about the affiliation. And that's, uh, that's how I think we can uh, deal with uh, racism. I, I believe that it has been shown now that we cannot combat racism through political correctness. If we were going to, if we were going to prevail against people who would like to see a racist, bigoted, fascist world through the efforts of political correctness, through the stories of the, of the pain of oppression, if we were going to prevail doing that, we wouldn't be where we are now. This, has, this, this approach that we've taken based largely on relativism is a necessary but insufficient condition. I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing these things. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be anti-prejudice training, that we ought not to be careful about aggressions and microaggressions and all of these things. But if that's all we do, it's not enough. And, um, and I think that that's clear at this moment, and we need to be moving forward and quickly. Well, I guess we're out of time. Uh, uh, there's practical ideas for helping people come to a more constructivist view. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to recommend some of the writing uh, as follow-up. Please uh, uh, take a look at the um, basic concepts of intercultural communication. Happy to have you do that. But if you're, if you're not interested in like, you know, one of those longer books, please feel free to pick up on some of the, um, uh, uh, the encyclopedia articles. And uh, those are downloadable from our website. Uh, and thank you, Sitar, for supporting this uh, webinar. Thank you all for joining. I appreciate so very much your attention. It's the most valuable thing that we can offer to one another at this time in history. Thank you.